unfathomable world. A world we know exists, but nobody wants to get to know. The men incarcerated here are extremely dangerous. Those are jump, jumping up heads and everything. Total anarchy. Another inmate attacked me. He stabbed my eye. No more corrupt, no better for me. Behind bars is a struggle just to survive. I don't hurt anybody else. I just hurt myself. And only the strongest will survive. I keep on fighting to get out of here for them. Their lives are always in somebody else's hands. Pretty much caged animals. They'll lock you up and throw away the key. Behind bars. In the toughest prisons in the world. The Philippines, a hot tropical country in Southeast Asia, jammed with 100 million inhabitants. A country in which 6% of the population is unemployed, in which the gap between rich and poor could hardly be bigger. The biggest problem? Drugs. Marijuana, crack, meth. Available all over the country. But those who take drugs will sooner or later end up here, at South Cotopato Jail. They're drug dealers, rapists, and murderers. I had to kill my nephew. It was self-defense. Guilty or not guilty, all the prisoners are awaiting a hearing, behind bars, often for decades. I can't do anything but wait. I miss my family so much. A trial of patience between desperation, heat, and a power struggle between the guards and those who are actually in control of the jail. All I can think about is getting out of here, escaping. Surviving in cramped conditions, without hope of release, in one of the most overcrowded prisons in the world. The South Cotobato Jail. New prisoners arrive at South Cotobato Jail every day, even though it's already massively overcrowded. This is the first time Ronier Dumagit has seen a jail from the inside. Why are you here? Stabbing. What happened? It was in a supermarket with a woman. Ah, attempted murder. The charge, attempted murder of a cashier. But the 35-year-old Filipino has still not been convicted. Technically, South Cotabato is a pre-trial detention center. Most of the prisoners here are awaiting a verdict. The question is, if a verdict will ever be rendered. No, and, uh, he's still, uh, until he will be trying. Try and from the court, then we don't know how long some wait here for months, others for years. Whether guilty or not guilty, murderers or drug dealers, on the inside it doesn't matter anymore. All that matters on the inside is survival. I'm really nervous. I don't know what'll happen now. It's my first time. Ronil finds out sooner than he'd like what kind of world awaits him inside the walls. On the inside of one of the most overcrowded prisons in the world. Welcome to South Cotabato Jail. A jail that is bursting at the seams. The average temperature is a tropical 35 degrees Celsius. About 2,000 prisoners wait out their time in a space designed for a number only quarter that size. 
They live like caged animals. Sweat, heat, no privacy at all. Desperation and rage, all concentrated in a space that is much too small. In his very first hour in jail, Ronil will find out who's in charge, who occupies what place in the hierarchy, and what awaits him here in the future. Everyone should know he's a newbie. And if he has enemies here, they won't recognize him immediately. We've all gone through it. As a new prisoner, Ronil is at the bottom of the jail's hierarchy. He has no rights. His belongings do not remain in his possession for long. The goal is to break the newbie. He must start from nothing, with nothing in his pocket. He must possess nothing but insecurity and fear. And no one protects him. I'm miserable. Everyone's watching me. These are Ranil's last steps under the watch of the guards. Once he enters the cell block, responsibility for the newbie falls to one of his fellow prisoners, the cell leader. From now on, he decides when Ranil eats, when he gets to go outside, and where he sleeps. Ranil's new home? a 270-square-foot cell inhabited by 69 inmates. It's the cell for new arrivals, regardless of whether they're drug dealers or murderers. Everyone starts here, in one of the jail's fullest and hottest cells. Get up there. You're new, so you sleep up there. Go on. The stuffiest place at the very top in the corner where the heat accumulates, where the air consists of sweat and frustration. Being here is terribly stressful. I've never been anywhere like this before. Starting now, Ranil must stay in the cell for 15 days. He can only go outside when the cell leader lets him and accompanies him. Ranil has no say in the matter. Only those who follow the rules survive in South Cotabato Jail. The biggest problem? The jail is utterly overcrowded. In only two buildings, designed for about 600 inmates, 1,618 prisoners are doing time. About 150 of them are in so-called punishment cells, cells that are always locked, for dangerous criminals, repeat offenders, or sick inmates. The oldest are in a separate wing for seniors. Also in a separate wing, apart from the men, are 400 women. Essential for survival are the jail's kitchen, the prayer room, and the visiting area, which is open once a week. The entire compound is patrolled by only five guards. And their hands are tied. 20 public servants against about 2,000 inmates. An unfair fight. Rodrigo Baludio has been a jailer at South Cotabato Jail for 18 years. It is his job to keep the peace. But he must always keep three things in mind. The danger to his men, corruption, and maintaining a distance between guards and prisoners. I don't let the guards enter the compound. Their contact with the prisoners should be minimal. Some of the inmates could develop a personal relationship with them. No matter what crime they've committed. And that can lead to other problems. That means one of the only jobs left is to monitor the outer walls. The guards must rely above all on security cameras and 
on the hierarchy within the prison walls, because the jail is ruled from within. For Baludio, that's a mental strain. I'm always under pressure. Every time my phone rings, I get goosebumps. I know that a call means problems, that something has happened inside, and I have to solve the problem as fast as possible. Fights, escape attempts, hunger strikes. Aludio has seen it all. But he can't change the situation in the jail. His people go inside the walls only twice a day to do a head count. It's 4 p.m., about 2,000 prisoners all in one space, and one guard to count them. The guard seems rather like a minion of those who are actually in control here. If Ronil breaks the law on the outside, he ends up in jail. Inside, he pays with his life. The one with the power to decide is known as the president, El Presidente. He is the boss in South Cotabato jail. We have rules here and you will follow them. Got it? Yes, sir. Respect me and do what the marshals and I tell you. Then you'll be fine. The hierarchy is clear. On top, the president and his helpers, the so-called marshals, armed with clubs. At the bottom, newbies, like Ronio. Otherwise, the only way to power is money. Prisoners with money can buy what they need to survive. Cigarettes, food from the jail's kiosk, and above all, fresh water. Those who can't afford it have to drink groundwater. On the tropical Philippines, with an average temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, this is a dangerous proposition. It's easy to catch diseases like tuberculosis, and whoever gets sick gets locked away in total isolation due to fear of epidemics. A fear that one man in the jail doesn't have, Glicerio de Pedro. In the jail, he is known as El Presidente. Number one. First, people have to respect me. Then, I treat them well. If they listen to me and follow the rules, then I help them with their problems. Glicerio de Pedro has been in South Cotabato jail for 13 years. In this time, he has become the most powerful man in the jail. The reason? His wealthy family. And wealth is both power and a status symbol. I'm here for murdering my nephew. We were having an argument over property. And the whole family thought I was the problem. They wanted me to die real soon so that they could get the land. So I saved my own life. I had to kill my nephew. It was self-defense. No verdict has yet been returned, and the president is waiting. But he is waiting with privileges that no one else has. He uses his status to operate a lucrative barter operation. He gives prisoners money, and in return, they give him televisions, cell phones, a custom-built bed, things that are technically prohibited. No one messes with the president and his marshals. Even the guards leave the most important job to the marshals, locking down the cells. It's 5 p.m., and about 2,000 prisoners have to be put back behind bars. Those who don't obey 
feel the whack of the club, or the power of the president, a system that seems to work based on respect and fear. I'm the overall checker and do the prep work for the guards. The prisoners trust and respect me, so do the guards. The guards rely on the hierarchy that rules the jail. There'd be no way to keep the mass of prisoners under control otherwise. One level below the marshals in the hierarchy are the cell leaders. They count the prisoners again. No one can go missing. The newbie is starting to understand how the prison works. The guards must do only one small job, lock the cell doors and leave the jail. The prisoners spend the next 12 hours behind bars. A struggle for survival begins, a struggle for space, for air to breathe. There is no access to food or water. The prisoners must persevere in one of the most overcrowded jails in the world. a prison built for 600 inmates. At the moment, three times that number are behind bars here. About 70 people occupying about 100 square meters. The average temperature is a tropical, humid 35 degrees centigrade. Hardly anyone can sleep. They just have to wait it out, to distract themselves, to get through another night, to survive for the newbie in extreme situation. It's Ranil's first night behind bars. It's unbelievably hot. I can't breathe. I feel claustrophobic. I don't know how I'll make it. The 35-year-old has no choice. He must persevere. If only for his four children and his wife who are waiting for him on the outside. Night falls. Darkness settles over the jail. All the prisoners are behind bars, except for one group of people that is allowed to move around at night. The privileged few, El Presidente and his entourage. In their eyes, this class distinction is totally normal. Everyone is treated equally here. Everyone but me, that is. I have a special status, but all others are under my supervision and are equal. Equality, clearly everyone defines it differently. One thing is certain, those who get on the president's good side escape the overcrowding. When I got here in 2002, I wanted people to trust me, so I followed the rules. Worked hard to earn the trust of the guards and the president. It wasn't easy. I had to work hard to get their attention. An unfair game, one that almost 2,000 prisoners can only sit and watch. But how did the jail get so inhumanly overcrowded in the first place? The reason is President Duterte's war on drugs in the Philippines. Duterte wants to clean the country up in a drastic way. Over a period of six months, he had 4,000 drug dealers murdered in broad daylight. The country has become a police state. Out of simple fear of being killed, in 2017, about one million drug dealers turned themselves into the police. And every day, the president throws hundreds of people behind bars. The prisons are bursting at the seams. But the Filipino justice system is not prepared in the least to deal with so many people. With over 700,000 pending trials and only 1,600 lawyers, a verdict can take years. Years in which the prisoners in South Cotabato jail must wait in suspense. Ronio has now made it through at least one night. The night was hot and long. I didn't really sleep at all. I always thought of my family. 
that they're out there all alone without me. It's the following morning, 5 a.m. As a newbie, Ronil is not yet allowed outside with the others. He has to wait and returns in his thoughts to his wife and children. He is not the only one with such thoughts here. Many are plagued by them, including Janel Berges. The 35-year-old has been imprisoned for five years for running a con. He is accused of embezzlement and defrauding customers. He acted out of necessity to help his family scrape by. So many happened in my life. I realized that he's, he's always it's very sad because we have two children, uh, three children waiting for me. It's, uh, it's my song of my son. <laughs> uh, what would I do without your smart mouth? Drawing me in you, kicking me out. Got my head spinning, no kidding. I can't pin you down. For Janelle, it's above all the desperation, the waiting that makes jail so hard. Meanwhile, he has arrived at the middle of the hierarchy. That means he is allowed to cook and prepare food with others that they bought themselves. Everything is done under the watchful eye of the marshals, of course, and of the president. Still, knives and sharp objects are allowed. No one rations the portions. But all this requires money for chicken, fish, or rice, or generous visitors. That's why Janelle pools together with a few of his fellow prisoners. As they say, a problem shared is a problem halved. <laughs> Some buy noodles, others vegetables, others oil. It's very difficult to survive on your own here. You're often sad, lonely, and you just sit in your cell. You eat the food they ration out. And without friends, you've got no one to talk to about your problems, about the waiting, and the abiding hope for freedom. You go crazy. Psychologically, the situation is unbelievably difficult. And no one can escape from the situation. Above all the newbie, Ronil is under constant observation. He's not prohibited from cooking his own food, but he has to earn the privilege first, with cleaning duty. At least that lets him spend some time outside. Can he enjoy some fresh air in jail? No chance. It stinks. <laughs> Disgusting. At least I'm outside and can move around. Even if the work's degrading. Ronil knows he can't sink any lower. He has to follow the rules. For he's never alone in here. Everyone sees him, sees every misstep. And every misstep is punished with food deprivation. Come on. Get up, get in line. 9 a.m. Meal time is the high point of the day for newbies and the low status prisoners. A bowl of rice with vegetables. The next one won't come for several hours. And they eat in the dark cells of South Cotabato Jail. <laughs> A 
A prison that is not only drastically overcrowded, it is also overshadowed by a hopelessness that affects everyone. No matter where they stand in the hierarchy, regardless of whether they can move freely, play basketball, or do something else, it's all just a distraction, a distraction from the waiting, from the constant hope and disappointment. Almost no one here has been convicted. Almost all are awaiting a verdict. Hearings do take place every month, and with them lingers the hope that one's own turn will come, one's own turn to be free. But waiting for a trial and a verdict can last years, sometimes decades, if it ever comes to trial. Those here the longest have been waiting for over 15 years. A psychological strain that not everyone can withstand. In five years, Janelle has already been summoned to a hearing 23 times, and every time, it's been postponed. Every time, the court was overcrowded. He wishes he could turn back time, give back the money he stole. The worst part about it, his wife is only a few meters away from him, also behind bars, in the wing for women, as an accessory to his fraud. It's all my fault, my mistake. It hurts every day to know that my wife is behind bars from my mistake. We're both imprisoned. And what hurts even more is the thought of my children. My wife can't see them and can't take care of them. Our children are alone when they have problems. We can't help them. We can't contact them. Can't even give them moral support. I can't do anything but wait. I miss my family so much. I can't take it anymore. Janelle and his wife are separated by less than 300 meters. Lovlin Bejes is also behind bars in South Cotabato jail. The reason? She is accused of having known about her husband's fraud. They are allowed to see each other once a week, but they hardly ever see their children. They live too far away, are poor, and can't afford the trip to the jail. The other women are in a situation similar to Loveland. Most are in jail for abusing drugs and prostitution because of the fast money and the hope of somehow escaping poverty. But that desperation has driven them into an even deeper futility, into a hopeless waiting. A jail in which desperation, frustration, and the struggle for survival live side by side in the smallest space possible. Up to 100 prisoners at a time are stuffed into cells the size of shoeboxes. Massive overcrowding and nerve-wracking waiting on the daily fare. Privacy? No chance. And the hope of being released is zero. That's why South Cotabato Jail is one of the toughest prisons in the world. It is a massive undertaking for the guards, a huge mass of people that can barely be managed, that rules itself. Rodrigo Baludio uses the last power play at his disposal. Time for a so-called greyhound, a surprise inspection of the cells. There's nothing to see here. Go away from the fence. And you all, get out here. Go on, get up. Get out. Faster, faster. Hurry up. About once a month, the cells and their inmates are inspected by six guards each. 
They know they can't stop the smuggling of contraband, but they can at least minimize it. Strictly forbidden are above all guns and knives. Everything that is dangerous or even lethal. Baludio is not surprised to find something right away. And now comes the hardest part of the job. We confiscate everything that's not allowed in the cells and try to find out who it belongs to. This person will be punished. The problem is finding the owner, as no one admits it. All the same, Baludio's team gives its best effort. Every corner of the cell is searched, no matter how disgusting it is. It stinks in here like old urine, but it's my job. This is part of the job. Except for visiting days, the prisoners are forbidden to have contact with the outside world. Cell phone. If we find out who the phone belongs to, he won't be allowed to have any more visitors and will be put in solitary confinement. I found another one, a smartphone with no password. The guards are in luck. If they find the owner, they'll finally have the upper hand and can set an example by punishing him severely and thus win some respect. I'm not sure, but I think he's in this cell. We'll check. Baludio definitely wants to identify the prisoner. He knows that the searchers are just a drop in the bucket, but they have no hope of winning the struggle. There are too few of them to keep all the cells in check. But every find and every punishment means a tiny bit more authority in one of the toughest prisons in the world. Authority that Ron Neal also feels. He quickly learns whom he has to respect. Even the one hour a day he gets to spend outside is not for free. Why don't you move over? Let him sit down. <laughs> More. Everything costs money. Even air to breathe. Ranil is fleeced for every cent. There's a logic to it. He shouldn't have anything anymore, except respect for others and fear. I can't take it here. I can't stand all the people. Inside, I can't breathe. And outside, I'm not myself. And all this because I got in a fight with a cashier. Ranil says that he got in a fight over money with a cashier while on drugs. And her boyfriend pulled a knife. Ranil had to defend himself. I wish it hadn't happened. I'd never react that way again in the future. I have a family, and whenever I think of them, I wonder why I defended myself. Why I didn't just let myself get killed. Because I have no idea how to survive in here. Survival. That's the goal of every one of the inmates in one of the world's most overcrowded prisons. Some live a life of oppression, while others are rulers of the jail. <coughs> Still today, 
is the one day a week everyone waits for that has great meaning for everyone because everyone needs visiting day. Sir, there are two new visitors here. Every Saturday, family and friends can visit the prisoners for three hours. The government calls visiting day an accommodation in return for how long the prisoners have to wait for a trial. Officially, the visitors can bring anything they want, as long as it's not dangerous. Food, money, clothing, and as much of it as they want. For the guards, it's the most difficult and stressful day of the week. Secretly, they know they can't check everything, but they at least try to find contraband. Knives, guns, cell phones, anything lethal or that provides contact to the outside world has to stay outside. We try not to miss anything, but certain situations make it easy to smuggle things in. These days are always so hectic. None of us is perfect, of course, but we do our best. That's why it's not only objects that get searched. Each visitor is also thoroughly frisked. Give me the fish and go into the booth. Anyone caught trying to smuggle something in is put on a list. The next time it happens, the person loses permission to visit. Lucy and Sarah visit their father in prison every Saturday. He has been in the overcrowded jail for six months on a charge of attempted murder. As with everyone, it's unclear what really happened, how long he'll be here, and if he'll ever get out again at all. But one thing is certain, his family needs him, and he needs his family. I feel my family's love, even though I'm inside here. They know I'm a victim. They stand by me. I'm happy they visit me every week. I need my husband. I'm all alone with the kids. I hope he gets justice soon. It's a brief moment of happiness, but still, it's a positive emotion behind bars. Joy, but under supervision. The supervision of the marshals and of the president, of course. Are they maintaining order, or do they want to see what's changing hands? At least today, they're giving their inferiors a small sense of freedom. Look what I brought you, Dad. In the Philippines, around 70% of children grow up without both parents. Lack of money drives fathers to work far from home in big cities, or they resort to crime. And criminals land in the endless holding pattern of the country's jails, like South Cotabato Jail. Here, the wish for freedom is and remains for most prisoners just that, a wish. Visitors, gifts, and above all, money to buy everything behind bars they need to survive. Many prisoners can only stand by and watch. Visiting day shows them what they don't have. Some are resigned to their fate. But Romeo Gomez tries to be creative. He carves and builds little houses, which he sells on visiting day to earn at least a little money. He himself never has visitors. Not one single person has visited him in 15 years. It's because of my case. It all began when I developed a good relationship with my niece. We were very close, and the family was happy that I took care of her. Until, until this unexpected thing happened. 
The family immediately cast me out. They said, now you're on your own. We don't care what happens to you. He hasn't been convicted by a court, but his family has condemned him. Even inside the walls of the jail, no one wants anything to do with him. He lives in the somewhat more spacious wing for seniors, and he survives only on the daily food rations and begging. It's a daily struggle. No one comes and brings me toothpaste or soap. I can't count on anyone. So I go around every day and ask the others for things. Sometimes I also sell my food ration to get some money. No one in the jail sympathizes with Romeo Gomez. The case of Lovlin Berges, however, who was only an accomplice but is being punished like drug dealers, murderers and rapists seems unfair, pointless. Being separated from her children breaks her heart. But at least she gets to see her husband on visiting day. I'm nervous before every meeting. I'm always happy to see him. But above all, I hope each time that our children will come visit us. It would be a nice surprise. Sadly, it happens very rarely. It is hope that helps Loveland persevere behind bars, the hope of one day seeing her children again. The meetings with her husband, Janelle, are the high point of the week. And yet, it is always an inner struggle to forgive him, to not blame him for her situation. Thanks for cooking. You're welcome. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Dear Lord, we thank you for this food. Thank you for protecting us in this situation, for always being there for us. We ask you to keep giving us strength, take care of our children, our family, protect them and us. Thank you for giving us so much strength. Amen. It's bizarre what happens behind bars here, but sometimes surprises happen, even in jail. I am so happy. If only my wish came true and such things happened every day. I really want to talk to them daily, to be in contact with the outside world, to see my children. But seeing my in-laws is also wonderful. I am so thankful and happy. But still, it is a short moment of happiness. If and when Lovelin and Janelle will ever be released, if they will ever be allowed to go home again, no one knows. Almost none of the 1,618 prisoners. Almost all are waiting for a hearing. Officially, the marshal has a court appearance next month, but will it take place? The president has already given up hope. 
He doesn't even try anymore to get a hearing. Still, his powerful status gives him a good life. A life Romeo Gomez will never lead. He will probably always be alone, without hope of release. And Ronil Dumagit, the newbie? He has to accept that from now on, South Cotabato Jail is his new home. Ranil has good prospects for a hearing soon, but if it will actually happen and if it will result in a verdict is unclear. In the last few days, I've tried to fit in. But it seems like it only gets harder and harder every day. I never would have imagined a life like this. It is above all the uncertainty that scares him so much. A hopeless situation that puts dangerous thoughts in his head. I think a lot about how to get out of here. I don't even think about my family anymore. There's just one thought in my head, escape. Getting out of here as fast as possible. I wish I could just escape from this whole situation. The 35-year-old Filipino doesn't want to accept what lies ahead. The hardest period in his life is only just beginning. A period in which he's all on his own. A life behind bars. In one of the toughest prisons in the world. South Cotabato Jail. <laughs>